The Reef Therapy Podcast is powered by ICP Analysis. If you'd like to win a free saltwater ICP analysis kit and a freshwater analysis kit, all you have to do is leave a comment down below using the hashtag what's in your water. If you're listening to the audio only version, head on over to YouTube and you can enter in the comment section there. ICP Analysis will test over 50 elements down to parts per trillion. These tests can also be used to see if there's any undesirable elements in your aquarium as well. Register your aquarium on the ICP Analysis app, fill your sample, place it back into the bag, slap on that included postage, and have your results one to three days after it's received. More at icpanalysis.com. What's up, Reef Builders? Welcome back to another session of Reef Therapy. This is 102, powered by ICP Analysis, and it's great to have the gang back together again. I feel like it's been a little bit. Raj, Salem, Tyler Wells is our guest tonight. Welcome in. Uh, this week, we dropped part one of our mangrove series, and I wanted to get my good friend Tyler here in St. Louis on this session so we can go over some mangroves and some macro stuff. So uh, we'll get to that, but uh, I want to delay the main topic for as long as we possibly can tonight. <laughs> and... Uh, Go, I'm just kidding, and go around the horn and just see how everybody's doing in their reefing world. We'll start with uh, Salem. What's going on in your world, man? All right, I've got my 48-minute uh, timer started here. <laughs> it's actually seven, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Nothing really. Same old, same old. I got the halides cooking stuff. I'm in the lab doing stuff. Crunch time. I got four weeks. Four weeks, people. I got to get the data. So I'm in the lab for like eight to ten hours a day pretty much right now. And that's my life. Yeah, you that's had uh, you posted up a photo of you in front of what I'm assuming is your lab area, but it looks like prison. Why do all schools, <laughs> to some degree, look like prisons? <laughs> uh, someone named Michael Foucault really talks about that extensively in his work on uh, biopower. So if you want to you want to dig into some philosophy and stuff, that's probably your answer there. But schools and prisons are designed in a very similar way in Western yeah. society. Yes, control us. Yep. There's, there's, there's psychology it. behind it, too. The, even the color of the walls, that's all intentional. The ordered and structured schedule to condition us yeah. to adhere to society's rules and regulations. Damn. What are you advocating for, Remy? Do you want you want anarchy here? Do you want us to not have uh, follow laws? I don't know. You want to go into that right now, man? I just want to be able to do my third graders' math homework, and I can't, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't, you don't like new math then? Okay. I don't like new math, no. Oh. <laughs> I feel like there are some people listening that can identify with me on that. It's like, what's 117 minus 57? Nope, you got to show the work to get there, and I don't know how to do the work to get <laughs> and there. And the work well, is now a flow chart. It's not just yeah. the work, right? It's a different way of doing the work, which we weren't taught, yeah. which is... Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Uh, Raj, how's things in your world? Uh, dare, dare I ask, is the tank we have talked about for over a year filled with water? It is not. Um, I don't, gosh, it's shocked, shocked, right? Um, I don't know. It, it seems like it's been forever since I've been on and we chatted about this, but I'm officially six weeks post-op now. And yeah, I've been dealing with all of that, so I haven't really touched the tank much at all. But I've had nothing but time to order random crap on Amazon um, and just really think about all the different things I want to do with the tank. And, you know, originally I was going to do the calcium reactor, calc reactor, all the things, just have it fully automated. And I started kind of thinking about that. And should I try something different? I'm... I don't want to like denigrate dosing people and for dosing people denigrate means to put you down. <laughs> you <get that? laughs> but, the there you go. Yeah. Um, I, should I dose? Like, should I, should I try that and utterly fail at it or end up loving it? You know, I, I, I'm not sure where to go with it now because I've just always been that calcium reactor and calc guy. So I, I feel know. like the, yeah. the, the aquarium has to fit your lifestyle, right? So while I really yeah. would like you to do something like the Moonshiners method, just so we have someone on this podcast doing it, uh, I don't think that that's going to fit your lifestyle very well. So I think the automated route is probably a better position for you to, to be in. Oh, we, this is not mutually exclusive. 
he could automate the moonshiners method. You can yes. have 50 <laughs> dosing pumps. And that seems to really fit your stuff. You're the you're the owner of MRC. You're telling me that you're not going to have 50 dosing pumps doing every trace. That sounds like I don't a know, total man. nightmare, man. <laughs> like this, no, it's it's I, automated. You hands off, you know. That's you. That's meticulous. Hands off is great, but I'm I'm more I don't know, simplicity may be a bad word, but really simplicity is key. The less things or the fewer things that I have to fool with, the, the less that can go wrong and the fewer things that I actually have to maintain. And since I hate doing maintenance, that's a really good thing for me. I guess you get your traces from good calcium reactors. I, just, I get this visual well, I mean, cal- of all of these dosers just like in a brick and tubes everywhere. <laughs> And it just looks so cool, right? (laughs) Yeah, it'll be like the, uh, what was the machine that broke the Enigma code? Did he, did he name that machine? Didn't he give it a name? I don't think. I thought he had um, Alan Turing. God, like the Turing machine. It's just, that's, they called it the Turing machine. But I think it had all of those dials that were spinning and that's what it would look like, right? The whole wall of that. Yeah. Love that. You'd have to yeah. you have to change up everything every single month, somehow, some way, figure out how to dose nine drops a day on things. You know, <laughs> yeah, that is so not happening. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be great, no. But every, everybody that I've ever seen that is using the Moonshiners method, and I know this probably can be, uh, it can be negated in some way, shape, or form. But I feel like everybody who does it loves it and sees good results. But you know, to each their own, right? Uh, I know there might be some people on this podcast that to disagree with that, but I if you're not using the shine it, is fine. yeah, there, I like that. The Look shine at that. There's fine. another shirt. There's another <laughs> shirt idea right there. Uh, Andre, if you're listening, the shine is fine. Have a shirt. <laughs> we'll push it. I'll wear it. Send me one. All right. So Raj, is that all you got with your, do you have any other questions? Anything you want to throw to the audience for the new tank? A new tank. I have officially abandoned the lighting idea because I have found it extraordinarily difficult to get those glass pieces. So, hmm. okay, as uh, I, I hate that, but um, you know, just another obstacle and roadblock in a tank build. Um, when you're trying to do something that is not, I guess, normal, it becomes that much more difficult, and it seems like those pieces maybe are hard to do, or maybe just the glass blowers have better stuff to do than to make these i don't know if you're a glass blower out there and want to make a bunch of them for me hit me up <laughs> richard ross where are you at <laughs> that's all i got uh yeah all right well richard tyler ross, let's move he on said to he you was gonna what? send me one but even my boy ross has let me down <laughs> uh tyler let's move on to you uh what's going on in your reefing world man Nothing too crazy. Uh, have the two main tanks just kind of cruising. Uh, I'm actually waiting for an order of uh, black mangroves to show up in the mail uh, so I can set up my uh, my new system. So I have a, a new tank that I'm setting up, a little tiny cube, specifically for black mangroves. So, yeah, it's been uh, it's been fun. Uh, did a cool little lighting, went out and got a cool little uh, floor lamp. Um, can be using just some, like, some really cool, like, PAR 38 bulbs. Um to light the mangroves above and create a cool little estuary tank. I think it'll be, it'll be neat. Be cool. But yeah, nothing nothing too crazy. I mean, right now I'm kind of, I'm kind of in your boat, Raj. Like I like simple. So like everything's has its purpose and that's it. So like, I'm not tweaking with anything. It's just, they just kind of run and it's for a reason. You know, I travel too much. I don't want all the gear and bits and all that stuff. Well, uh, I think you and uh, Raj should get together because I feel like you have a good eye for aesthetics and um, lighting. So that that might be like because I know that on that new tank that you've got, you've got those par 38 bulbs, but you've got them in um, in like, you know, typical interior design kind of fixtures. Yeah. So that's what I was trying to do. So that could be cool. Like a plan B. I like a plan B. Yeah. I mean, I, I live in a small apartment. And so to me, like aesthetics also mean something like I want it to look good, not just be a tank that's set up. Like, uh, it has to be the entire package. And so I was like, well, how, how do I light this corner tanks or it's, it's a cube, but I kind of offset at 45 in a corner. 
um, and make it look good um, and have that elevated light for the mangroves. And so, yeah, I found a really cool, tall, like 80 something inch floor lamp with uh, three multiple, like three bulbs. Um, and yeah, I was able to cover this nice little 15 gallon cube. Um, so when the black mangroves come in, they'll have plenty of coverage and it'll be cool because then that light will trickle down into the tank and little tiny pockets of, of photosynthesis and everything else will happen and it won't just be a completely lit tank. Um, nice. you need, I'm hoping to grow some sponges. I'm, I'm going to work with Salem to try and find the, the right, the right uh, juice to put into the tank to, to grow the heck out of some sponges. It'll be really cool. Sponge core time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I will um, say out of all the systems I've seen, yours are definitely like the most aesthetically pleasing. Like you have like the whole like, pi- like right behind you, like the pipe like fixture. Like that's really cool. Everything looks very clean. So if people want aesthetic advice, I'd say they should, should come to you probably. And that's cheap. That's literally Home Depot like iron pipe that i painted and <laughs> it's just easy it was like like use a larger pipe for the one going up and then a, a, a smaller c- cylinder i think it's like a quarter inch one going across so it's lighter um but i wanted it to you know be rigid so that way the light white didn't actually cause any like sagging across the tank so that way it stays flat but yeah you can you make simple things and then to make sure that it doesn't fall on the tank I actually created um, a wood platform that goes under the, the tank itself, a stand. So it creates a C and C's can't sort of fold in uh, if you think engineering wise. And so it'll always sort of stay in that C sort of form. Um, so I won't ever have to worry too much about it tipping into the tank itself. As long as there's not a lot of weight on it. But yeah, that's one of the things I, I enjoy about shooting at Tyler's place is that he uses predominantly full spectrum lighting on most of his tanks. So it is so easy to shoot video at his place because you don't have to deal with the orange lenses and the white balance mixture and all of that kind of thing. So it's just it's so much fun to shoot there. White light tanks are awesome. I don't know why people hate on them. I think they look incredible. Uh and right, you get to set your Kelvin spectrum in your camera like 5,500 and you can just shoot for days and never have to worry about taking on and off that orange filter. Yeah. Yeah. It looks very nice. Very nice. Um, well, uh, in, in my world, I'm going to Australia tomorrow, so I need to probably you know pack at some point. That has not happened yet. <laughs> I'm here doing a podcast <laughs> with you guys. Uh, <laughs> We'll be in Melbourne for the majority of this trip. Uh, we really, I, I push really, really hard to go elsewhere in Australia, but I don't think that that's going to happen on this trip. We're just not. It, it's funny because I think my total travel time is ten days, and it's still just not enough time to yeah. be in Australia. I really feel like to do it right, you need to be there for at least two weeks, and if you can push to three perfect so unfortunately no snorkeling no scuba diving or anything this time but i think it'll be a good scouting trip to you know maybe just get my feet wet because uh other than like turks and caicos the bahamas jamaica and mexico i haven't gone international so this is like the biggest international to go right like all the way around the other side of the world (laughs) um so, but I'm, I'm super excited about it. We're, we're going to be doing the, uh, the pet show there. Uh, Evie and I are going to be doing a reef therapy from that convention center. So if you are listening in Australia, um, make sure to come on out and say hi. I know there's not a huge saltwater presence there, but we're, uh, hoping to change that, uh, just by being there. And uh, I know that we've got, uh, hopefully have something set up with, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Parker's reef, uh, uh Sam Parker. He's got a YouTube channel and uh, he's got a beautiful tank and he's about an hour south of Melbourne. So we're hoping to meet up with him and uh, maybe do a reef therapy session with him as well. So very excited about Australia, not excited about the fact that my tanks will probably suffer while I am gone. I do have the local fish that are coming over every other day to kind of like make sure all the technical stuff is okay. Um, Thankfully, the local fish store owner lives in the same town that I live in, so he can just you know stop by here on his way home and check and see if everything's good to go. But I uh, also have a water change to do tonight <laughs> on every system. <laughs> I just got done doing a water change on my son's uh, beta tank, <laughs> which is just an algal mess. But uh, sure. but yeah, so that's kind of uh, that's kind of what's going on in my world. The Red Sea's doing fine. 
Um, I, I messed with some things, got salinity back on track, um, added a little bit of, um, mixture of, you know, some air mixture in there to make sure that I'm getting some oxygen and some, uh, some of that into the water because it, you know, one thing I was talking to Chris Meckley about this and he said, you know, what's nice about all these red seas and these cades and, uh, water box aquariums is they all run super silent, which is fantastic if you've got them in your living room. However, you don't have a lot of air mixture in the tank. So you're kind of suffocating things to an extent if you're not like opening up those drains every so often. So what I've done is I've just elevated the, um, the return lines out of the water a little bit to give myself a little bit more. Uh, and also was thinking about just running the protein skimmer, but without a cup on it, uh, just to get some air mixture down there in the sump too. So that seems to have helped a little bit with my issues, which is good. Um, and also I, I'm, I'm coming here to tell you Salem that, uh, <clears throat> I have turned on my, UV sterilized. Oh, no, you were doing so well. <laughs> you were following the path. Oh no. Yes. Uh, this was <laughs> yes. this was a suggestion by Chris. Now I will say this: it, it is if there is such thing as a therapeutic level of UV, it is ripping through. It is ripping through. It is not slow at all. So, but he does have a point, and I, I do like. <clears throat> Like he does have a point with the just exposing the water column to UV light because a lot of the LEDs don't. I mean, they're, they're, there's none in most of these LEDs, so you don't get the the UV from the halides that you would normally get. So, to me, that hypothesis kind of that makes sense, but I don't know. I don't know. I would love to hear your thoughts on that as as you. Uh, <laughs> chew on this a what is bit. this hypothesis that uh uvc Just, is yeah exposing exposing the water column to uv helps that doesn't expose the corals directly however i would imagine that there's probably some microfauna some sort of uh, bacteria something that could benefit from uv i don't know i'm throwing this out there to you guys uh, Chris Meckley, you better you better call me on that one. We've got some things to talk about. I've got think, some, uh, quite a few counterpoints, I think. I think Meckley might have been snorting some co uh, calc when he came up with that one. <laughs> I, I do. On, what are, what I are your counterpoints? I, but... I want to hear them now. I want to hear a couple of the counterpoints uh, now. Um. Okay. So I uh, he's got the, he's. He has been grasping for some time of why UV matters. And I think I know why after doing some research this last week. And I'll share that in a new article probably coming out like by the Damn time it. this comes out. So so that's cool. Um, I think that'll answer his questions of why he likes UV with halides. And like it answers all of Dana Riddle's arguments. Who's the typical person who's been like, no, UV has no use. Um, anyway, so there's that. I think the core will have to be exposed to UVA and UVB. I think UVC is a completely different ball game. The coral aren't being exposed to it. The water column is. That's killing all of your picoplankton, which then harms the coral's nutrition and then also like a thousand other downstream effects. I I understand because you have known pathogens in your tank, which are waterborne, both fish and coral. So it makes sense. But in an ideal world, the benefits of UVA and UVB you get from metal halides or the correct spectrum T5 bulbs is not equivalent in any way to the UVC hitting the water column for th these are two this is apples to oranges and i yep. i agree with raj's analysis that uh there was some calc involved <laughs> <laughs> and that is no hate on chris now, i love chris, now, it's, now, chris it's, I, assuming that listening. it's a good quality assuming it's a good quality uv lamp right the, the spectrum is going to be very limited to uvc yeah. and like salem mm -hmm. said even if it is a bad lamp and it's emitting uva and b it's not getting in contact with any corals or anything. So it's, it's not doing anything except heating your water. Yeah. There's, okay. there's coral associated microfauna, which I will not name at this point because people need to read the article and, you know, direct links to the website and things like that. Um, but it, it's not the water column. It is what lives within the coral in particular the skeleton. 
I do want to I do want to say I'm paraphrasing Chris so I may have misheard him so if he's listening right now and just furious with the way that I I presented <laughs> his information I apologize for that there's gonna uh, be like a paragraph in the comments yeah like, right just like endless rant anecdotally though I will say everything bounced back I actually had a Milko stylo that was on the way out and it has stopped it has completely stopped and it is coming back now so I mean, we're talking Milka Stylo. We're talking about a pretty hardy SPS coral and um, just those Didn't three you, things. Though, also adjust your salinity. Yes, I did. Mm, yeah, so I think that yeah, might be the that causes. Might be the main, uh, might actually be the main factor because I was at about 33.9 PPT and I bumped it up to 35.4 ish PPT. <laughs> um that doesn't seem like it's a, it's a lot it's right it's not a lot That's maybe in lot. conjunction with the other two things this is the and this is also something we we had a conversation chris and i he's like you're going to change all these things you're not going to know what did it <laughs> uh -huh. i don't think it's the uv now see i didn't realize the salinity was that low it doesn't seem like a lot but to to a stylo that's been aquacultured for like 20 years and 35 to 36 parts per trillion yeah i might be a little bit mad you know yeah. Yeah. Most corals will, especially SPS. Yeah, but the stylo is one of those where you can drop in the mud and it's going to do fine. It's super Sure, hardy. but think about like for how long it might have been low, plus an experience, the other salinity swing from his auto top off, plus he's got like three coral pathogens in the system. There's like 10 variables working against it. I don't think the UV, by the UV is what's helping. <laughs> yeah, and then, now it's got no picoplankton to feed on. Like, you know, I don't know. Maybe he's feeding enough externally. You don't need that. There's a lot of... Uh, I'm feeding good vibes. Uh, Sounds I'm like it's miss. happy without the Pico. <laughs> it might be, but like, you know, is it thriving? I will say we that if you, uh, if you are a beginner slash intermediate and have always followed the, you know, salinity of, you know, 0.026 or 0.25 or whatever, change your meters over to PPT. It just gives you yep. a, a way more accurate uh, representation of what's going on in your tank. So uh, Chris said 35 to 35.5. That's a, a good number to shoot for, especially if you've got SPS in your tank and uh, they are not super tolerant of swings and things like that. But definitely switch over to, to PPT and look for that 35. So uh but yeah that's that's pretty much everything that's going on in my world i can't wait to come home and uh, everything's passed because you know if you talk about vacation or if you talk about leaving too much out loud in front of your coral they know <laughs> and they will just pass they know so i hope Th you have that's... not named any fish <laughs> i'm not worried about Never the fish, the fish. fish fine <laughs> uh, if they've got names you should be i'll tell that's you that's why right i'm surprised now. you're actually going to do a water change tonight that's that's asking yeah. begging for trouble, right? Like, do you guys do I that? Don't, There's no way. Leave it alone, man. I am it's touching my good. tank the day. Yeah, nope. leave it. Yeah. If it, even if it looks dirty, I'm leaving that thing alone. I'm leaving it. Right. Let it do its thing. Leave it. Turn off the UV. Going. Go to Australia. Like, there's a lot of things you can do. <laughs> don't turn your pumps off before you leave. You never know Nothing. if they're going to turn back right. on. <laughs> yep. Look, I, I understand and I get it. I But the glass is so bad and, like, the, the LFS is, is there to over see it. And... Dude, man. <laughs> if Who's nobody's there to see the dirty glass, <laughs> is the glass really dirty? Give the trochus a feast. Let them live. <laughs> All right. Give thanks, the guys, pico uh, organism something to graze on. Yeah, yeah. Give. Yeah, you got to do something for your microbiome, man. I uh, I appreciate you letting me off the hook for having to do anything else other than pack tonight and you know hang out with my wife and watch the rest of Ted Lasso. So thank you for that. Uh, we just got bluebell ice cream in this area. I don't know. Do you guys have bluebell down there in the south, uh, Raj? Yep. Oh. Oh, <laughs> I came in with a vengeance. And, and the thing is that schnooks, you know how like drug dealers are always like giving things away for free to start to get you hooked on no, it. I have no, no idea. What no. <laughs> wow. Uh, we have a, we have a sweet grocery chain named schnooks, which I realize is really weird to people that aren't are in that this is. area, but yep. they sold this stuff for like three ninety nine for a half gallon for like a week. And now it's $9 for a half oh, gallon. Oh my God. Damn. <laughs> they say, yeah, there's demand. <laughs> still bought it. So there's so many different flavors to try. Anyways, uh -uh. let's get into the meat. 25 minutes for everybody keeping off. 24 minutes and a half uh, for those We can go much longer. 
Yes, we could. Uh, Tyler Wells is here. Tyler is a good friend of mine in the reefing community here in St. Louis. And uh, one thing about Tyler that I enjoy is his red beard and also uh, <laughs> his appreciation for this hobby on a different level. I feel like I was pretty blown away by his tanks when I first went over. Uh, he's got a pretty large presence on Instagram, inland underscore reef. And you see things in his tanks that you don't typically see in most people's tanks. So Tyler, can you kind of take us through, I guess, your reefing philosophy as it goes before we get into the mangroves and macro talk? Yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, really to be honest, my reefing philosophy started in the same way anyone else, anyone else said. I had a bio cube. It was blue light, mixed reef, threw everything in there. It grew fine. And then I was like, you know what? Uh, we went snorkeling down in the Caribbean. I was like, man, this is really cool. You know what I should do? I should make like a Caribbean tank. So when we moved to this apartment, this tank behind me was set up just to grow Gorgonians. And Gorgonians look terrible under blue light, especially the photosynthetic ones that are like browns and purples and maybe a light yellow or tan. Like it, it looks awful. So I was like, all right, this is this is where we're going with this. And then I... Uh, I'm a big proponent of looking at dive photos to help me understand how to better aesthetically create a reef uh, in my home, my home yeah. aquarium. And so I started looking at some some cool Indonesian, you know, Raja Ampit sort of uh, styles. And I was like, oh, yes, like I need to make a cool Indonesian sort of that style of reef. So all of my soft corals came out of the Caribbean one because there's not like soft corals like, you know, um, sarcophytans and things like that in the Caribbean and went over to the other tank over here um, to create a cool Indonesia style. So like my style of reefing is more in the realm of I want to remember the times that I went like snorkeling or or I got to experience uh, certain areas. I've never been to Indonesia. It's on my bucket list to go, but uh, I've snorkeled quite a bit in the Caribbean. And I just, after a long day of staring at a computer, I don't want to come home and look at a blue light tank. Like I got enough blue light from a computer at work. I'd rather come home and just look at something that reminds me of like laying on a beach, hanging out and then jumping in and going tide pooling or something like that. So that's sort of my style of reefing. It's evolved over the years um, as most people's styles do, but, um, and mangroves are just awesome. Like how cool is that? <laughs> like it, it, you now have a tank that you know you have filled you know filled with corals and everything, and now you've grown a tree in your house apartment. I, I just think they're so cool. Um, so my uh, you know house plant addiction has now also stemmed over into my reef keeping addiction. So yeah, that's kind of just the background of me. I just like to create weird environments, uh, try to embody as much of what I see actually in the ocean or in pictures that were taken by divers. Um, and not sort of create these artificial style reefs that we, we see a lot in the hobby today, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I think there's less, there, there's more to gain when you have larger, larger colonies and a cool sort of, um, biome, um, than just everything sort of right next to each other attacking day in, day out. Yeah, I think a lot of people, cool. oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Mangroves I, are, I, I geek out over like the tiniest details and things. So, you know, you know, I like quirky facts about stuff or get into the biology of things and like, oh, that's really cool that this animal does that. So uh, mangrove, well, you, we've all seen mangrove pods, right? Like they uh, just look like pencils. They're, when they're in salt water, they're, they're laying horizontally sideways and they'll travel for, up to a year or longer to get to a freshwater or brackish because it's really a brackish water plant. Now, when it hits that salinity, the, the pod will upright itself and go vertical. So then the roots can touch the sand and, or the bottom can touch the sand and take root and plant itself there. That is like the coolest biological evolution that's taken place for that. It allows it to spread from where they, I think they started in the South Pacific and just spread all over the world and kind of find those freshwater or brackish water spots where they can thrive. And that's just so neat. That's so cool. And the fact that they can thrive in both fresh brackish and salt water, like yeah. there are very few plants on this earth that can actually do that. 
and do it well, like really survive. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. One of the fun facts for me was that the propagule is in and of itself a tree ready to go. Um, you know, I think, as I said in the video, a lot, you know, we're used to trees dropping seeds and the seeds germinate in the ground and they don't really do much after that. But there's a sweet, there's a, an amazing clip of this last, and this last mangrove video of Julian. Uh, <laughs> kind of illustrating how this happens in the tree and he sticks a propagule through this hole in his hand <laughs> and he's like it's a lot like childbirth <laughs> and i think that needs to be on a t-shirt too um that's, that's one i will definitely wear uh, yeah <laughs> i'll make sure he signs that one for sure but uh yeah there it's just a, it, it is a, an amazing uh tree for sure and the fact that we can grow them inside our reef tanks at our homes uh just and i think it combines and we talked a lot about this raj with mark when uh when mark was on the podcast more frequently uh you know that that nurturing kind of thing where a lot of reef mm -hmm. keepers also have a uh, an affinity for plants as well like you said tyler so um i think it's a cool marriage of both of those things plus you get a cool habitat for your your little critters like when the once those roots go down and the prop roots happen you've got this really super natural uh, hiding spot for all the critters in your tank so it's it's really cool like so i have a, a small little i guess you call it shoal it's not like a school of um of damsels they're like the lemon peel damsels um in this little indonesian tank over here and so that one's actually one where I've experimented using driftwood. So I used uh, pine manzanita wood or pine spider wood um, in my saltwater tank. Not common in any sense. Um, and if you read anything about it on the internet, they'll set, tell you that it can't be done. This tank's been up for almost two years and uh, I'm growing corals. Well, mostly soft corals, but I'm growing coralline like crazy. So clearly if I wanted to throw some SPS in there, I think I could probably, probably get away with it. But it's cool because I've replicated that sort of... Um, early sort of um lifespan of a fish right they, they normally will you know they'll they'll grow up as a, a small little fry in these mangrove roots and they'll swim around and duck into the roots and so that's that, like just what you're saying remy like i've created this environment for these young damsels it's really really cool to watch them swim around so you can take an environment and put in manzanita wood and all kinds of random crap that's not supposed to work and you can grow sps I'm gonna try Salem. You paying attention, Salem? Yeah, I'm listening. Okay. I think there's I think there's reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have I have the aquabiomics microbiome tests. I bought those at Reefstock and I am um, actually itching to to get that test sent off on this tank with the driftwood. I really want to see what the microbiome Ooh. is in there to see like why I'm having such good success. I mean, granted I'm dosing Kalkwasser to maintain my pH because if anyone knows anything from the freshwater side, driftwood or any type of wood leaches tannic acid. And tannic acid, of course, will lower your pH. Um, so I've been dosing calc on the, uh, at night. And I also have, right now, it used to be uh, just macroalgae, but now there's a Chicago sunburst down in my sump. So that's <laughs> on the reverse schedule. Um, and so that's hopefully helping to keep that pH from, from uh, going too far to the, you know, under eight. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm growing coralline where I'm having to scrape it off the glass pretty regularly and it's growing all up the driftwood, which is really, really cool. That's You've cool. also got corals gr growing on the driftwood as well. Yeah. Yeah. That was the other thing I wanted to do is when I started this tank behind me, I really wanted that like 10 year old tree. I wanted to be able to plant corals on the actual mangrove prop roots. I think that's like the coolest thing. If you ever go out in the into like the ocean or anything seeing corals growing in a way that's not just on rock work is the coolest thing ever so when i these when this root system over here i have one that has like it's almost four feet long one of the prop roots i've been planting gorgonians on that one and then over in my indonesian tank i've been planting um i have a bunch of sarcophytons that are on there and different areas that are planted actually like glued to the driftwood so they're like elevated they're not just sort of at the bottom and it, it creates different layers um of perspectives when you when you're creating this reef i know it's it's hard to manicure a saltwater system i know it's very easy in the freshwater you can come in and just kind of clip some of the leaves or clip some of the stems um, but i've i've tried to 
manicured enough where if you step back, it really does truly look like you kind of took a picture from the ocean. Yeah, it's really awesome. That's awesome. Um, why don't you, well, let's dig, in, dig into mangroves a little bit and tell me if, if I'm a beginner and I'm starting with a propagule, A, what species is good to start with? B, does it need to be in like potting soil? How do I start it? Can I just throw it into my tank to start? Take me through, uh, you got a propagule in the mail or you've, you know, pulled it from wherever uh, legally and uh, we're, what's, what's next after that? Sure, yeah. So I think there's, there's two ways you can do this. A lot of times in the hobby, we see a lot of mangrove propagules that are sent to people or, or people pick them up with roots. I actually don't really prefer that method because the roots are pretty delicate. Um, and I, I've had you know discussions with Julian about this. Um, mangroves, red mangroves, uh, that's probably the most, the one I would recommend. A red mangrove would be the one that I would recommend to to a hobbyist or someone getting into it. They're also the most common. You're not really going to find a lot of the other ones unless you're a nerd like me who's searching on Etsy and hoping that my package arrives. <laughs> Please, it's been in the mail for nine days. I hope it arrives. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I actually really like purchasing the propagules without leaves or, or roots. Um, and it kind of goes back to what Raj was saying. You know, you've, you're, you're able to sort of instigate like its beginning stages it hasn't already started that rooting process and so what I, what i typically do um is when i collect them i'll just inspect to make sure that it's not like hollow or anything like that i'll, I'll actually pinch the mangrove if it feels firm then i know that it hasn't started to rot on the inside um, sometimes that happens things will burrow into them they'll start to actually decay the last thing you want to do is put a decaying mangrove in your tank it's just not going to work out um but then secondly, I don't just shove it right in the sand. I think that's where a lot of people uh, either do that. They'll, they'll either shove it in the sand bed or they'll shove it right into the like a hole in the rock work. Now, you can do that. But I think the really cool lure of like red mangroves are the prop roots. You want to see those prop roots. You want to get that good prop root growth. So um, you can either grow them in fresh water or brackish water or salt water. You don't have to sort of... Um, uh, acclimate them, especially if they don't have any roots. Um, and what I'll do is I'll take like a clear acrylic rod and I like to elevate my mangroves kind of similar to how Raj was saying, you're going to let those roots grow down into your system. So I tie the, the mangrove as high up, um, in my water line of my system as I can, um, because that will instigate the longest amount of root growth. And so you'll get those long prop roots growing downwards into your tank. Um, and clear acrylic, it, it'll just blend in. You won't see it. Eventually, your mangrove will root, and you can cut the fishing line off and take that uh, that acrylic rod out. Now that you have a nice prop, you know, man mangrove with a lot of prop roots, um, if you can put it in a place of really good flow, that's even better. That just like goes right into its natural um, like sort of um, progression of growth. Right? It's it has to put its prop roots down because it has to stabilize itself. That's the whole purpose of a red mangrove is. The, the prop roots are there for stabilizers. The waves are crashing against it constantly. How can I stabilize myself so I don't fall over? Um, and that's the same way we can mimic that in our, in our home aquariums. One of my best mangrove trees is actually the original one that I put in this tank about four years ago, just a small prop root. I stuck it pretty much right in front of my uh, MP10. And that MP10 has is on like almost 90% like flow. Like it is blasting down because it's a peninsula. And, uh, I, I mean, I have a prop root that is coming down across my tank. That's almost now f almost four feet long, that one as well. So like over four years, I've grown a tree that essentially has the prop roots people are looking for, and I haven't done anything special. I've just maintained a good, um, husbandry maintenance and elevated the mangrove and placed it in good flow. And then the thing that people don't realize is that they always want they want the leaves. They want the big giant canopy. The canopy doesn't come if you don't have a good stable root system. So like any tree you see out in nature, um, you, you can't have a big giant canopy if you don't have stability down below. So once those roots really take hold and you actually have that good root growth, your canopy will take off. It'll grow uh, almost so quickly. Like you get to the point where people say like, I'm growing SPS like weeds and I can't, I can't get rid of it. Right. The, 
you know, Mark, Mark will throw it in his backyard, but, um, I just, I mean, I, I trim my mangroves almost monthly, uh, because they're just growing into the lights they are growing that quickly. So if I were to start fresh with a brand new mangrove, that's how I would do it. Um, but if you were going to go to a local fish store and you got one that had some roots on it, or maybe a couple of leaves, that's pretty common, um, of how they show up to like a local fish store. Uh, the one thing I would say is, uh, kind of keep the same sort of mounting and, and, and positioning in your tank that I've talked about previously, but inspect those roots. And if they look broken, um, I use super glue to essentially just cauterize that area. Um, so a lot of times, um, we hear that misconception of like man, red mangroves like to excrete salt from their leaves and you have to spray them. That's actually black mangroves. Black mangroves excrete a lot of salt from their leaves. Uh, red mangroves excrete salt um, through some of osmotic pressure in their trunks. You'll actually kind of see it around that, um, that, that just above the water line, a little bit higher, not just right there. Um, but when you have a broken root, it kind of opens up that tap. And so when they're bringing in water and sort of flushing out their system to get more nutrients and just the way any type of you know, root system would in a tree, um, it doesn't, it's not able to regulate that amount of salt water that's coming in. Like Raj was saying, they're mostly brackish or fresh water. So when we put them in a full salinity uh, situation, if stress or anything like that happens, that's what causes a lot, a lot of mangroves to die within the first week or two. And my, my number one factor of when I, when I ask people, you know, they ask me, Hey, how, how do I know if my mangrove is dying? If you can pinch the trunk and it's squishy, that's it. Like hope for, hope for the best. You might be able to pull it and throw it into some fresh water, but most likely that mangrove has been inundated with so much salt that it's, it's sort of, um, it can't flush it out. So, and you mentioned, you know, how the prop roots can, can grow a little bit faster or more robustly if you have high flow because it mimics kind of the environmental triggers that cause them to develop. Have you noticed in your systems that directional flow in one way or another will kind of guide, like, can you guide or kind of control how the prop roots develop with the way the flow comes in or is it just kind of random? I, I would say it's random. I don't think I can control the way the prop root is going other than me manually actually directing the prop root. I've done that before just to, um, get it out of the way of some flow. Like I've, I've had some mangrove roots that have grown so into the flow that it's actually limiting uh, like flow to the rest of the tank. And so I've, I've been able to sort of adjust it, um, carefully, very carefully adjust it. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, the only one I would say that I would, I think directional flow has caused proper growth would be in this system because it's a peninsula. Um, the flow is only coming from the one side. And so I actually see prop roots only on the opposite side of where the flow is because the tree's being pushed this way. And so it's stabilizing itself on the opposite side. So I rarely see prop root growth going the opposite direction. It doesn't need it. So the tree's not going to expend energy to put a prop root that direction if it's not what's being, you know, what's, what's happening to it. That makes sense. So I know with SPS, depending on how strong your flow is, it can grow thicker or thinner. It, mm -hmm. Are you seeing that at all with the prop roots or do, do the roots just not care? Um, I definitely see thicker prop root growth where there's more flow. And I think that's more in the realm of it needs to be thicker to be more of a stabilizing factor. Whereas in a lower flow area, like I have some prop roots that are tucked in the driftwood in here and they're, like thin, they're like the, the normal size, like thin, um, you know, prop root sort of growth and maybe over years it'll get bigger, but I, I think I've instigated larger prop root growth by having that flow be there. So lighting is obviously a huge consideration whenever That's you're cool. growing, um, mangrove. <laughs> That's so super cool. what, what is, uh, what would you suggest? Cause I know that you've used a bunch of different kinds of lighting. Uh, what would you suggest for that? Just use my regular reef lights and that works or should I, do I need to get special lights for these mangroves or, you know, what would you suggest there? Yeah. I mean, so mangroves are versatile. I think the same way that corals are versatile. We, we have 
a multitude of different lights and they grow corals. And I think the same way we have a multitude of different lights that can also be utilized for mangroves. Um, I mean, I have mangroves just in the windowsill. They can just grow based on some ambient sunlight from an east facing window. But in like a home aquarium, it really depends on what you're sort of going after. Like these mangroves are going to grow up larger. So you have to think about that when you're actually lighting your tank. Um, so in the past, what I did is I actually used floodlights. I went to Home Depot and bought a bunch of floodlights and they were like, I don't know, 4,500 Kelvin, like super yellow. But I, I was like, well, a floodlight has a, a wide, um, swath of lighting and I can h- put it up higher. Um, so that way it doesn't sort of introduce that super yellow light into the tank. You know, we want to see some colors in the corals. We don't want it to be so so white or so like, you know, um, brown and everything. But, uh, I mean, I've used also just normal like grow bulbs. You can go get a grow bulb from, um, you know, any hardware store and you can utilize that. Now, when it comes to the sort of the aesthetic process of it, um, that's where I've gone to more like point source lighting and point source lighting for me allows me to raise the lights up higher and then be able to direct that lighting down towards the mangroves. It's, it's less of like a blanket and more of a point source, which is good and bad. Uh, my mangroves are growing sort of in a canopy bowl towards the light versus if I had more of a, um, complete covered, I think you'd see more, you know, uh, you'd see more flat when it comes to the growth pattern. Um, but I think we can sort of see that in any, so, uh, any type of, you know, coral growth as well. Um, I think it's, I think it's similar to coral. I mean, once you sort of, um, get them introduced to the lighting, they'll, they'll adapt and they'll grow. Uh, of course, more intense lighting will make them grow better. I mean, that's, that's just what anything, if you have, you know, more, something that's not as bright, uh, it won't help with the chlorophyll. So that way you can actually get that photosynthesis that's happening. Um, but I've seen mangroves grow perfectly fine under the blue reef LED, you know, our normal blue light, um, reef LEDs. Um, but preferably to me, a a mangrove doesn't look good under blue, um, you know, that blue spectrum. So I, I tend to, to run mine more on the whiter side. So, so a lot of my tanks, actually the lighting schedule is more like a bell curve. And so it'll be sort of blue in the morning, the afternoon, but during that peak hours so about four hours a day i'm blasting almost 100 percent intensity 100 percent color so that way the mangroves are really getting that that harsh uh, midday sun um, and i think that that actually has helped um, and on top of that just giving them a lot of light you don't want to just light your mangrove for a couple hours a day i mean it's a treat it, it, in the wild it gets sunlight all day so giving it you know 8 10 12 hours depending on how you're you're running it uh, I think will be beneficial to the the health of the mangrove. So if you, Tyler Wells, has unlimited budget, unlimited space, this is something we kind of talked about at Reef Stock. I thought it would be cool to talk about. What would you do to push the limits in terms of macroalgae and mangrove care? Is there anything experimental you would you would try? Don't worry about coral. You're trying to grow macros and mangroves. What would you do? Oh, is this the, is this, are we going into like the propagation stuff that we're talking about? Oh, we or? can, I, whatever you think. I was thinking like you mentioned CO2, like uh, yeah, so, system, but on a saltwater tank. Yeah. So I was talking with some, uh, some friends of mine in Japan, uh, who are really big into macroalgae. And so if there's anything that we know about like planted tanks from the planted tank realm, they use CO2, uh, they inject CO2 into the tank and it helps with the, um, the plant growth, right? Uh, I'm not, super familiar with all the, you know, chemistry that goes in, involved with that. But, um, in Japan, they're actually utilizing sort of a, a very limited CO2 injection into macroalgae tanks to, mm. to help grow them, I guess, better <laughs> because to them, they're, they're treating it like it's a plant. They don't have to worry about the pH unless you're dealing with like, um, calcium based macroalgae, um, like halamida and things like that. Uh, but I'm wondering if, that could be beneficial to the mangroves, right? Uh, I don't know. It's it's uh, something that I want to tinker with, but I also think about it logically and where mangroves come from. And they're in these like mud flats, which are usually hypoxic zones. So they typically don't have a lot of oxygen. 
So I don't know if that would be super beneficial to the mangrove trees, but definitely the, the macroalgae, I think, could have a positive effect. But you have to be careful, right? Because now CO2 also limits your your pH. So kind of a yin-yang, you, you kind of have to balance things out. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That's, that's, I don't know, thoughts that I always, uh, everyone wants to grow mangroves quicker. And I don't know if there's a way to do that. Um, but maybe, I don't know. What if, what if it deals with the hypoxic zone, right? Like what if the, what if there's some type of like sulfur metabolism that they have going on because of the anaerobic stuff? Like you think, you think deep sand bed in a drum, you plant a mangrove in it and it can go down like 10 feet deep into sand. I don't know. I, I think that would be good. Actually in this tank, there's about, I'd say seven to eight inches of sand where these big mangroves are at. And, um, I did that on purpose for the, the reason, I mean, this was back when I first started. So I didn't really, I didn't really know a ton about how to grow mangroves. And the one thing I knew was, well, it's a tree and house plants, you usually have a substrate that's rich in nitrogen or some type of fertilizer. And so what I did is I, I, I put a small acrylic dish full of mineral mud and then I capped it with sand. And so I was, and then I planted the mangroves in that substrate. Uh, and I let, well, not exactly plant it. I set them above and I let the roots grow down into it. And so, you know, four years later, that nutrient source, of course, has been expended, right? It's been utilized by these trees. So now I put root tabs in there. So I actually push <laughs> root tabs down into the substrate, um, down past that sort of um, into that hypoxic zone, about four inches down or so. I just take a little rod and push them down in there. Um, and usually the plant itself will tell me, right? Everyone with house plants, you'll see, you can tell what a plant is deficient in based on its leaf structure and what the leaves are showing. And so I was showing that I was deficient in nitrogen and magnesium. Um, and so I started planting these, these root tabs down there and you could actually see the coloration of the leaves come back. They weren't yellow with these veins. They're now these actual like nice vibrant green leaves so i i think you have something to it i mean i've discussed with some folks about bacteria and i think that there is something about anaerobic bacteria and that hypoxic zone that could be beneficial that the mangrove could actually utilize for better growth um i don't know deep sand beds maybe maybe it's the return of that for mangrove growth i don't know maybe create that as your uh, your cool cryptic sump I, I don't know something something neat try one in a uh, sulfur reactor just jam it down in there and see what happens that would Actually, be cool that would right? be really cool to see if if that would work tyler's oh, man, uh, dude you don't have tyler's to place is gonna look like breaking you bad here all the time. <laughs> that's so yeah. awesome I'm like you were I, saying I think, that i'm like i don't think my man. wife would enjoy the smell of sulfur <laughs> <laughs> Have you thought about like, um, like making kind of like your own little potting mix, right? So like, you know, like you'll take vermiculite and perlite to get like the nice amount of like air space. And then you'll have like potting soil, your generic mix, like, like taking like aragonite based sand and then like actual like potting soil, like potting soil is used like with freshwater tanks, right? Like, I don't know, maybe something wacky like that. I mean, I've thought about it. Technically, the sand that's in uh, the Indonesian tank here is actually play sand from Home Depot. So it's like high in silicates, of course. Yeah. Um, and mangroves seem to like that, too. So I don't know. I'm, I'm playing around with different substrates. Um, I, I have a friend who actually just picked up uh, a really cool substrate mix that actually does include sort of that, that dirt. And I'm really tempted to try it out with these black mangroves because black mangroves are, if you kind of look in the line of like how mangroves are structured along a coastline, it usually goes white, then black, then red. And, and the blacks are, or the black mangrove is typically in that very muddy sort of semi-terrestrial, semi-aquatic environment. Um, and so I really, I'm, I'm very tempted to try um, like this soil mixture um, for growing the black mangroves. Now, when it comes to like the red mangroves, I, I don't know. I mean... They're, they can be in mud flats, but they're they're also in that aragonite areas. Um, so I, I don't know. That's a I think that's a Julian Sprung question. I would definitely be interested to see his take on it because he's the one that told me how to grow mangroves outside of a tank, right? Uh, I, I was chatting with him at Aquashella Daytona, and then once and then again at Reefstock. Uh, he's like one of my favorite people to just uh, just throw ideas at and be like, hey, what do you think about this? 
Um, but yeah, in the pot, I'm just using like normal potting soil. Uh, mm -hmm. so I just has perlite, things like that in there. And I just mixed in some, some sand just to try and, uh, not have it so, uh, dense when I filled it up with water and that's it. I just planted the mangroves in there and filled it up with water and it's my little pond. And as long as the roots don't dry out, uh, the mangroves are growing like crazy. So I think there's something to different substrates. I mean, we'll just have to, I guess, experiment. I think that'd be a cool one, Salem. We should, we should try, try some out. Yeah, like what about like black sand, dude? Like high iron content? Like they use iron. Like, I don't know. Black That's... sand, potting soil, the silicate based sand. I don't know. You could you might be able to make like a super mangrove substrate mixture. <laughs> that would be that would be cool. I mean, mineral mud was is high in, in iron, I believe, as well as the um the root tabs I'm using also have iron as well. It's a it's an element that I think is readily taken up quickly. And so uh, it becomes deficient pretty quickly. Okay, so there, there's our mangrove moonshiner. And then we got to get the mangrove probiotics with the like <laughs> mycorrhizal fungi and weird stuff. This, this We're going to unlock we the secrets, man. I, get think, I think we're getting somewhere. I like it. I, hey, any way to tank. grow mangroves. I yeah, should. he has the CO2 he adds. I forgot about that. I should. Yeah, that would be that would be really cool. He's got I, I it think, up far. Yeah, I think there's... I think most people can keep a mangrove in their tank. I really do. I, I think that the problem is, is it's not those who are keeping the mangrove. It's the fact that it was um, either poorly handled or mishandled on its transport to and from, you know, the fish store or in the shipping that I got to you. Um, I mean, I had, I, I, I remember years ago, I, I had vacuum sealed mangroves that came in, like they just smashed all the roots and I didn't know. And so I, actually put 13 of them in this tank and one survived. So it, it, it took a lot of time to actually determine sort of through, I guess, the scientific method to figure out why problems were arising and how to fix it, right? I don't want to kill things. Like that's, that's what everyone, uh, I think hobbyist is going after. They want to be able to um, feel good about what they're doing and grow something successfully. And the last thing you want to do is buy something and, you know, you had your heart set on it and it doesn't live for very long. So have you thought about exploring any other plants? So like I'm trying to think of like the beach, there's the intertidal zone and there's like a lot of those weird, almost like succulent type semi-terrestrial, like marine aquatic plants where like the high tidal come in and they'll be partially submerged. Like, I don't even know if you can buy those things. I can't even think of a species off the top of my head. I'm just thinking like beach yeah. on Florida and this like with your style, but like a wacky paludarium with like these semi-terrestrial plants, then macros and a mangrove. It's, it's that funny you say you that. that? Um, and, and, and Sean Ono, uh, who's, you know, writing for Reef Builders, uh, him and I have like thrown ideas off there. Um, I did actually buy a, a tidal species of, of grass, um, what I thought was grass. And I'm pretty sure they sent me leaks. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, they uh, they didn't survive clearly. Um, and I'm pretty sure I was like sending a picture to Sean. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I'm gonna make like this, you know, tidal area, and it's gonna be awesome. And he goes, I'm pretty sure you got leaks. Like, I'm pretty sure they just scammed you. <laughs> and there's like, there's uh, nothing I could do. I was like, uh, eBay, can I get my money back? And they're like, you got the product. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, it was. I, I have looked into it. A lot of those sort of semi-terrestrial um, plants are actually uh, endangered um, and protected mm. for a good reason, ah. right? They're 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 necessary for keeping the the sand, the bluffs, those areas um, from eroding. And so, of course, they don't want people to come in there and take them for you know hobby use. And I am a hundred percent okay with that. Uh, yeah. The the one that I bought from said that they. They grew them. It was like growing in their backyard. Like they had a picture. I fell for it. It happens. But um, I think that would be really cool. Like my ultimate goal aquarium is to mimic a literal slice of the ocean. I want to go from white mangroves to black mangroves to uh, red mangroves to a fringe reef. I want to have like mud skippers and like um, what do they call them? Like the mangrove crabs, the... And, and just have the entire section from like your terrestrial into that like fringe reef and and hopefully put a cool little wave box on there. Like 
this would be my my dream aquarium. Like if I had no budget whatsoever, it wouldn't be a twenty thousand dollar reef or twenty thousand gallon reef. It would be the most obscure reef anyone would probably see. Beach in your, you just want a beach in your house. That's all you what want. If, what if it's still absolutely yeah, exactly cool would be just to pull up a lawn chair and just like <laughs> kick your feet up into your into your reef? What's the so uh, hear me out? We take that idea. But we make it twenty thousand gallons, and you get one of the marine Galapagos iguanas. <laughs> that would be. I just cut out, didn't I? <laughs> Insanely cool. No, I heard the iguana. That would be really cool. Just a bunch of anoles running around too. I think it'd be it'd be pretty sweet. Okay, cool. There's a uh, mangrove adjacent um, tree in the Florida area, I believe. The buttonwood. Have you heard of this? Yeah, I've heard the buttonwood. Yeah. Um, I don't yeah. know a ton about it, uh, but I, I have heard it. I think you can get those. So that that might be something to experiment with. That's not technically a mangrove, but you know, a plant that can be found in that area. I I asked uh, Julian Sprung. He's gonna he's it's gonna sixteen dollars. Try and get me a white mangrove. That's been my my hunt right now uh, to to try and find a white mangrove. And I was talking with Jack actually at uh, uh, Aquashella Daytona and. Uh, he was showing me that they have variegated mangroves, and I guess Julian has one. And so now I want a variegated mangrove. I think that is the coolest thing. It's like white and like it has white. I also want a variegated. <laughs> and so I didn't think it was real until I was down in Puerto Rico and we went on a mangrove tour in you know into the back to see the um, that photosynthetic algae that you can like if it lights up with movement. And I actually saw a variegated mangrove tree and it was the coolest thing ever careful guys we're, we're on the precipice of like white storm <laughs> mocha mangroves here so just I, <laughs> I will never name a mangrove that and i hope it never gets to that point and if it does then I, i'm done with mangroves <laughs> i'm out <laughs> <laughs> Tyler's the hipster um, of mangroves. Master mangrove. He liked the mangroves yeah. before they were cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm the hipster <laughs> of mangroves. So, yeah, was, when I was, was here cool. 4,000 years ago, uh, uh, I do want to ask about, um, so we've, we've kind of talked about getting the propagule and the beginner stuff of, of, you know, putting that into your reef tank. What are, are there any like pests that can come along with these things? And I know like, obviously the, the reef pests that we all know and love so much, the flatworms and things like that, but are, are there any pests that affect just the mangroves that you need to watch out for in a reef tank? That's a really good question. Um, so I think just like from the like water line down, so like in the actual tank itself, um, I would just be concerned with you know, any type of like worms that we have in our tanks that are getting up there and burrowing into the actual mangrove. I mean, we have things, burrowing worms that go into coral and we see that that's happening. Now I have no experience actually seeing that um, happen. So I, I don't know, but I'm assuming that that is a possibility. Now actually ab above the water line, when we get into the, the leaves, I mean, you can have normal pests that we have in just, you know, keeping house plants. Um, I actually, uh, one time had where they call them like the woolly mites. Um, they, they kind of, they create this sort of like wispy sort of, um, I, I don't even know. It almost looks like a web. It almost looks like a spider web, but it's, it's some type of uh, a mite that actually attacks the, the, the mangrove leaves. And, uh, you can try and use like, a like a, like a Dawn dish soap and water mix and spray it to try and kill them. Aphids. Um, but they're aphids thank you yeah aphids yeah. um and uh it didn't work for me so i actually ultimately had to cut back one of my mangrove trees to save the rest because they're really pro prolific they they hmm. do get around and um and can actually torment it's killed a couple of my house plants which which really sucks and so the last thing i wanted to, to do was to kill my mangrove trees so um I did what any hobbyist would do, chop it back and let it grow back up again, uh, just like we do with corals. And uh, the cool part about that is you can now shape the tree the way you want it. Um, so it'll usually branch out more than just that singular branch coming upward. But that would be my own. That's my only like experience with pests that I've seen to um, go against the mangrove tree. Now, if you do end up getting those crabs, the um, mangrove crabs, they do actually eat the leaves in the mangrove. So they'll climb up the mangrove tree, eat the leaf, and then come back down. 
Um, so you definitely don't want those if you want to keep your canopy. Um, so they don't, they're not really sold too much in the hobby because they're more of a terrestrial crab, but we know that Remy got himself a terrestrial crab from his reef scabies. So maybe <laughs> you might get them. I do have know. an answer on that. If we could digress for just one second, um, David, um, David Lemus figured out what it is. Uh, he called it the, I'm, I'm searching for it right now, but it's actually a, uh, it remains small, which is fantastic. It's called a modeled or a modeled shore crab. Hmm. And I think it's max, uh, the max land, Remy. Yeah. The max length is like three and a half inches or something like that. So it will never get to be a huge size um which is good and he's doing fine in there so um he said uh took a screenshot of yours in the top down uh narrowed it down to a mud crab or a shore crab since yours is a juvenile took some research but there's an entire site dedicated to crabs and crustaceans <laughs> and he found it <laughs> modeled my type of shore place. crab yeah so it doesn't look like it uh, i i'm not going to take any risks and throw it into the display it's doing just fine in the uh sump and you know solid cleanup crew for the sump because uh, he's getting bigger so he's eating something but um uh, does as it stay aquatic for its entire life that's a good question. I have not done that much research on it yet, but uh, oh, <laughs> just, oh, no, it's no. actively trying to get out of the water right oh, now. No. And I yeah. cannot get out of the I'll, pump. Like, oh, I'll be sure no. to make changes before I leave for Australia. So, <laughs> stick it in your, get like uh, a turtle platform tank. in there for him. <laughs> um, I want to ask before before we uh, before we part ways tonight, and I don't know that we're, we'll have to put the macroalgae on the back burner, and we'll get to that in a future episode. We'll have you on. Um, but I wanted to talk about uh, the bonsai wire that you use because I know a lot of people try to trim these and, you know, you want that broad canopy, that Julian sprung broad canopy and his, you know, front pond. So I know that you can kind of trim to make it look like that, but you've taken it a different way and you've actually used bonsai wire. We've had a couple of questions on that. Uh, just, you know, metal and reef tanks. How do those things go together? So um Take us through your uh, your methodology on that. Yeah, I actually watched that part one video, and I uh, I misspoke uh, on that part, so I want to clarify and I guess uh, follow up on that. So the wire I use is aluminum wire, and it's um, capped in like a silicone rubber around the outside, not copper. Not sure why I said aluminum covered in copper. That's not good. You definitely don't want that. You don't want <laughs> copper <laughs> dripping into your tank in any sense. Um, so. So yeah, I guess people who are concerned about like metals getting into their tank and, and sort of that whole process, um, I actually super glue the ends of them. So where I cut the wire itself, I'll just put a little dab of super glue gel just to cap it in case for some reason. Now granted, I don't spray my mangroves. So the likelihood that water or any type of um, something that will transport that metal down into the, uh, the tank is very minimal. And so the cool thing about it is that most mangroves will just grow up. They'll eventually branch, um, but it, it'll it take a while for that to happen. And so you can instigate that by trimming or by using bonsai wire. So uh, bonsai uh, or bonsai, however you want uh, the proper way to say it, um, is another like hobby of mine. And so it's just kind of taking uh, plants and creating small miniature sort of trees inside of pots. Um, and so I look at these mangrove trees as small, right? These are tiny compared to a lot of what we see in, in nature. Goodbye, Salem. Um, <laughs> and, and so I use the wire in the same methods that most bonsai uh, techniques are done. So wrapping the wire in the direction in which you're going to bend, you can you know, start your wire down on the trunk and then wrap it all the way up. I use thinner wire, so I use like a th like three millimeter. Um, and if I need it for larger trunks, I'll double up the wire. Um, and that's a pretty common technique. Um, so instead of using just a thick wire, that's more likely when it, when you're going to actually do the bending, uh, you'll more likely break the, the, the mangrove, uh, branch. So by using double the wire, you're, you're having a little bit more flex in that and a smaller wire will also help with that as well. But what that does is it allows you to create that 
that canopy, right? You can see it in this tree right here. It grows straight up. Like it went straight up to the to light. And so what I've been doing is, is slowly actually training that tree uh, because that was one that I acquired through a, a tank breakdown. And I've been cutting the top and letting the canopy and the branches grow back out there and utilizing that bonsai wire to help flatten uh, the, um, the flatten the branches. So that way it, it looks more like a tree out in the wild. Hopefully, hopefully that answers the questions about my misspeak in the, um, the, the recent video. Yeah. As I was editing that, I, I actually, I thought about that and I was like, that doesn't make any sense, but you know, maybe it's just me not understanding what's going on here. I, uh, but you know, Sometimes, Remy, you stick a camera in front of me and I just I start saying things. I don't even know what I'm saying. So you know, <laughs> sometimes you get gold. Sometimes you get not gold. <laughs> real, real, real briefly before Copper. before we wrap, I, I, I know you keep saying I keep saying that. But uh, uh, we talked about shaping and bonsai. But you also mentioned in that description that you don't spray your leaves. And I know that that's kind of, uh, it's, it's, it depends on where you are in the country, uh, as far as your theory is concerned. But I will say, uh, Julian said something, he's like, well, it does rain in the wild. So, I mean, is that something that you would consider with not spraying? I mean, yeah, it rains in the wild. I mean, that's, doesn't mean it's washing salt off the leaves. It could be washing dust and other things. So I think really, the i look at it as if you want to spray your leaves use it to help with your relative humidity right if you're in a dry location or if you're in a very dusty location use it to rid your leaves of that dust so that way it has a better transportation of photosynthesis through the leaf and i mean because if a leaf is covered it, it won't get uh, as much photosynthesis so i agree julian is right about that it does rain in the wild now in my i don't have the scientific background to state yes or no on whether or not the um or at least not the background the science the, the background in science to say that it doesn't excrete salt from its leaves now i think it may excrete trace amounts but if you put my black mangrove leaf next to my red mangrove leaf and i showed you guys when you were here you can clearly see the difference between one that excretes salt crystals from its leaves and one that doesn't. And the black mangrove is riddled with salt crystals, both top and bottom. And my red mangrove, it looks like a little waxy cuticle. That's, that's, and maybe that's people, to, to me, it looks like it's a waxy cuticle on top of the leaf. And you'll see it a little bit. And maybe that's people thinking that that's salt. And maybe that's me not knowing that that's salt. I don't know. But um, I think it'd be really cool to, to dig into that more, but I agree. I mean, yeah, the wild, it rains and I, that, that happens, but I think that the rain also helps with a lot of other things because you have wild animals that poop on your tree and other things that are, are affecting the, the inhibitants of, of photosynthesis to the, yeah, to the actual tree. So that's, that's what I kind of go with. And, and in the same sense, like what I was discussing in the video, uh, humidity, right? Remy, we live in a very sort of humid environment. Um, and so we don't really have to worry about humidity. And if there's anything about, you know, a tree that's supposed to be in humidity and a non-humid environment, it's it's going to dry up. Like, so the leaves will get crispy. And, and I know Jake and I have talked about that. And, you know, he in, installed that sprayer system. And he was like that. He was telling me, he was like, that's the, the best thing for mangrove growth. But in my head, I'm like, I don't know. To me, that could actually lead to problems. You can actually grow fungus. So if you have a high humid environment with water, you can grow fungus on your trees, which could be good, could be bad. Um, I don't particularly want to grow fungus on the tops of my trees. And so uh, I just think that there could be more side effects than it's worth. Um, but once again, I think it's all about where you are located. And maybe, you know, what your, your style of reefing is. I, I don't know. I just, that's, that's sort of my approach. I've been growing these trees for gosh, half a decade and I have sprayed them a handful of times and they have grown just fine. So I, I don't know what to attribute to, uh, good care, good husbandry, 
I, I don't know. Uh, but I'd be open to, uh, I think, learning more about uh, the actual salt process, uh, salt excretion process, because I have read that red mangroves do store salt in old leaves that drop. So maybe... Like sacrificial mis- leaves, right? Yeah, maybe that's yeah. the misconception, right? It's 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 maybe we've we've looked at the wording and we've read something and through the process of telephone we've lost the original connotation of what was actually said it's like and everything so, in the reefing hobby <laughs> right so I, I don't know if 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 someone said hey there's salt in the leaves or on the leaves we got to spray it when in all honesty it's salt in the leaf and that leaf dies and goes down into becoming the substrate for the 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 uh, mangrove to to use as fertilizer. So, I'm 100% open to having my opinion changed. Um, these are these are my views and my uh, I guess my experience. So, yeah, definitely open to it. How's the humidity in Atlanta, Raj? Right now it's great, but um, in a couple of months it's going to be awful. <laughs> I don't miss it's living brutal. in Atlanta, Raj. It was that that summer heat is just. It's brutal. I'm not, yeah. let's be honest, St. Louis ain't, ain't any better, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we get, uh, right now we're in pollen season, so we're getting hit with that. Ah, the good yeah. snow pollen season. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, does anybody have any other questions for Tyler before yeah. we wrap up tonight? Salem, I do want to uh, attempt the propagation project. So keep the, I think that's I think that's a really cool thing that we should attempt to see how we can propagate mangroves other than we'll let the we'll let the people see what that's about sooner. Yeah. Rather than later. I think so. I think we should. uh, I think it'd be cool. Be cool article. Tyler and I have some wacky things in the works. Just like which uh, there's too many damn (laughs) projects. Reefstock Denver created a novel of projects and things to look at. Yes. Reefstock Denver but, was so uh, fun yeah. of just like throwing things at Salem, being like, "What do you think, Salem?" He's like, "Ah, this is this is good. I'm gonna add that to my list." <laughs> I just find it, I find it so hard Three a.m. in the that. lobby. Oh, okay, yeah. How would that not be already researched at this point? But I just feel like you know, trees and regular animals get so much more research than the ocean and corals do. I feel like there's got to be papers out there on different propagation techniques. I'm techniques looking right now. Mangroves. There's got to be something Looking out there right now. I mean, probably because mangroves the, don't need the help. Yeah, right. They they're right? really good at dropping their property. Oh my god, it's a thing. We thing. we, we, we have to do it, Tyler. There's like four papers. <laughs> really? Oh, awesome. <laughs> We're gonna do it. This giant. We're gonna, we have to here. do it with the, with we the Julian visual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this right here. This giant branch is going bye bye. <laughs> We're gonna cut that sucker off. No oh, way. Damn. There's one from 2019. That is exactly what we said we wanted to do. Like, like, just look at the title of the second one. Oh my one. gosh! Yeah, hormone. It's verbatim. Root. That's exactly okay. what we were talking there about. There we go. Our right. crazy conversation in my car on the way to the studio has come to fruition. <laughs> there will be a Reef Builders article about this. It will be cool. Quite Get ready. Hobby. Come to fruition. Tyler is coming for you. Yeah. I yep, love it. Right there. Send me these articles. Nice. I'm going to dig into them, and we're gonna we're gonna do something cool. Awesome. Okay, let's do the let's do Love the thing, it. and you need to send me your aquabiomics results because I'm thinking about tannic acid. I've been thinking about this whole time. I think there's some cool things going on. It's what makes. I my think we grow. should we should add wood to our tanks. I'm going to dose wood. <laughs> Isn't that pretty much what? Yeah, actually, I started um, dosing uh, peanut butter. Um, that's, uh, <laughs> that's my new dosing. So. The mix of peanut butter Dude. and tannic acid. I think that's actually... Do not actually dose works. peanut butter to your <laughs> reef tank. Disclaimer. New, new shirt says, hashtag got wood, and it's a mangrove. <laughs> I love that. That's great. I do like that. That's actually clever. I do like that. Gives new meaning Got to wood, proper. question mark, and it's Raj's face like, and then it's a mangrove tree. Or Julian Sprung's face like, and then it's a mangrove tree. I think Julian Sprung. I think that's great. I think that'd be awesome. But. Custom ink. Someone put the order in right now. <laughs> I love it. All right. Before we get but, too far off the rails yeah, here, because okay. um, uh, we'll get called out for that as well in the comments. Uh, at 120, they stopped talking about anything worth of noting. <laughs> so. <laughs> but uh, Tyler, I do want to say thank you for, for coming on. We, we super appreciate it. And uh, 
Uh, definitely, if you have any mangrove questions, you can always hit him up him up on Instagram. That's inland underscore reef. You can see his beautiful trees there. We also documented them in the latest Reef Builders video, so that's up on the channel as well. I uh, just want to say thank you for joining us on this session of Reef Therapy. Also, thanks to ICP Analysis. More at icpanalysis.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. See you.